So uh, good morning and a warm welcome to everyone. I'm honored to chair this panel discussion that addresses the concern of half of the population, the well-being of families, preservation of cultural values, the progress of nations, the competitiveness and future readiness of economies and businesses worldwide. Yes, I'm talking about gender bias. Women hold half of the sky, but do they get a fair share of it? Women voluntarily engage themselves in taking care of family and involving themselves in chores like cooking, cleaning, fetching water and groceries, taking care of children and the elderly. These jobs play an integral role in developing and nurturing society. However, they hugely comprise of unpaid work. Women's unpaid work subsidizes the cost of care that sustains families, supports economies, and often fills in for the lack of social services. Yet, it is really recognized as work. All over the world, men tend to earn more than women. If we consider the sum of paid and unpaid work, women tend to work more than men, on an average 2.6 extra hours per week across the OECD. Women carry out at least two and a half times more unpaid household and care work than men. As a result, they have less time to engage in paid labor or work for longer hours in the offices. This leads to underrepresentation of women at the workplace, especially in senior positions and high paying jobs. It impacts their ability to influence decision making in essential household matters including how their own personally earned income is spent, their ability to seek loan, own land, and control productive assets. In certain countries, the gender discrimination starts at birth. For example, in India, for every 100 boys born nationally, 91 girls are born. In China, nearly 112 boys were born for every 100 girls in 2017. It's needless to say, that it is a result of traditional preference for boys and sadly, selective abortions. Surveys in 55 developing countries reveal that girls are more likely to be out of school at a lower secondary age than boys, regardless of households, uh, wealth or location. In most countries, the gap in higher education, health and survival is decreasing. This has led to a rise in a uh, female, uh, in female labor force participation in the 20th century. Yet, it is alarming that globally, the percentage of women participating in labor force is declining as per World Economic Forum's 2020 report. Economic participation and opportunity is still an important area of concern. This is the only dimension where progress has regressed and the figures are sobering with the deteriorating situation forcing gender parity to as low as 57.8%, which implies that it will take 257 years before gender parity can be achieved. These numbers clearly indicate that the issue of gender gap needs to be proactively addressed in every possible way to make the world a level playing ground for women. Today, we have a very accomplished women, highly accomplished set of women in this panel. They have not only made their mark in their respective fields, but are also contributing actively to uplift the women around them. I would now like to take the opportunity to introduce all these team speakers in no particular order. I would like to begin with Ingrid Vanderwelt. She is the chairman and CEO of Empowering a Billion Women, EBW Distributors and Wonderworld uh, Global Investments. Previously, she was the first entrepreneur in residence for Dell Inc., where she, saw, uh, where she oversaw entrepreneurial initiatives worldwide, helping to build a 250 billion business segment and founded Dell Center for Entrepreneurs Initiatives during her term. A big hi, Ingrid. Uh, I would now like to welcome Bonnie Lau. 
Bonnie uh, is uh, the founding member of Social Enterprise Research Academy in Hong Kong, which unites 10,000 leaders and organizations to advocate CSR hosting symposiums with world class speakers, including Nobel laureates and United Nations spokespersons. She is also the vice president of China Miss Entrepreneurs Club and Chinese University MBA Alumni Association. I would now like to welcome Jeffy. She is the CEO of Paddy Connections and a partner uh, for leaders who want to know how to enroll more stakeholders into their vision of growth and progress. She helps leaders to know how to operate from an inner place of having more insights, bigger vision and higher possibilities by learning more about their own leaders paradox. I would now like to welcome Deborah Wang. Deborah is a serial entrepreneur with 20 years of experience in founding companies as a member of the executive corporate management as well as corporate legal counsel. Currently, she is the founder and CEO of Kingdom Investment and Development, which builds affordable housing for homeless and low income people at, La at, at LA area. I would now like to welcome Radhika, a postgraduate in management from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. She has over 30 years of experience in banking with reputed banks. She serves as independent director on boards of several NSE listed companies. She has served on boards of nonprofits for 18 years and is a former chair of Friends of the Women, Women's World Banking, a pioneer in microfinance sector in India. Zoe Kuo. Zoe, I would like to welcome you now. Uh, she's an entrepreneur in creative industry in China and, feminine, and a feminist. She, has, she was born in a very traditional Chinese family and received her higher education from top UK universities. Now she has returned home and has been running her own creative and cultural firm. She is the co-founder of Embridge Cultural and Creative Limited Company in China. She's mostly involved in helping local government for city branding and cultural development. Last, lastly, I would like to give a quick introduction about myself. I am Preeti Dubey. I hold master's degrees in uh, management and psychology and run soft skills, uh, soft skills consultancy and training company called Strive High. I'm involved in culture change and leadership development projects across the globe with different companies. Women leadership is a, is, is a subject that's very, very close to my heart. I work closely with women leaders and I'm involved in various women empowerment projects for underprivileged women. Once again, a very warm welcome to all of you. My first question would be to Defi. Defi, women continue to be underrepresented in the fields of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. They represent only slightly more than 35% of the world's STEM graduates. Less than 30% of the world's researchers are women, and this underrepresentation occurs in every region in the world. Your background is in technology, and you work with high performing clients to help them reach their goals. What do you think is the reason behind this? What do you think? Do you think that the aspirations and preferences of women are influenced, influenced by the societal norms and family values since early years of their lives? Devi. Thanks. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Uh, and, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, the background in science and technology. And I, and I and I just want to want to really you know put this put this uh, um, personal journey experience on the table. Uh, <clears throat> I think most universities today, most tertiary, tertiary education systems today, provide equal opportunity for both guys and girls, with exception, with exception, and and that's from my time of um, those courses where the government will have to invest very very heavily in the continued career progression. Usually, <clears throat> from my experience, that's in the medical segment. So there, are, there was, at least it, it, to my knowledge, in the Asian uh, segment of the world, or at least in some parts of the Asian segment of the world, <clears throat> there is a slight preference 
for males versus females in my time. That was 20 over years ago um, at that time. So today we are seeing what I think are decisions made 20, 30 years ago. However, today, today, does that still hold true? I think we will see the results only in the next 10, 15, 20 years from now. I believe that has equaled out significantly. So while we live today in a result of decisions made 20 years ago, we must be very careful about the kind of um, the kind of conversations that we're having on this topic, uh, you know, because actually the decisions might already have changed. And there are equal opportunities, I believe, to a very significant extent where the young people are enrolling in science, technology, engineering, math. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that I'm seeing is a vast difference is in terms of how they, uh, how women actually digest all of that information and, and, and what the uh, output is as a result of going through that. So there are obviously preferences, uh, you know, uh, some, there, there's a, there's some who continue with the heavy numbers and the infinites and the infinity kind of mathematics and, and very deep tech sort of stuff. And there's also uh, a large, uh, more maternal instinct kind of careers, which, which, which deal with management, with deal with culture, with deal with leadership, with CS, you know, all of that, put all those soft pieces together. Um, so essentially, I think science, tech, engineering today, uh, for people in power, for people in government and in politics, they are a result of decisions made about 20 years ago, easily, 20, 30 years ago, right? But however, we need to take into account the changes that have occurred as a result of, you know, time and also the progressive knowledge of um, this uh, diversity and, and slight imbalance. There is, I think, a little bit of... Um, difference in terms of how you know parents would look at a, a boy or a girl child uh, and that I think is prevalent in all parts of the world uh, and that I think is, it, it doesn't necessarily relate to just science tech engineering or whatever it just is a prevalent uh, behavior of parenting and I think that that does not it has changed a lot because parents today are very different from parents of before. Um, however, I think there are still some little bits where the conversation of parenting could could adjust a little bit uh, in order for a better balance and better equi equity for people when they grow up from here to the next 10, 15, 20 years uh, where they move into leadership and political leadership type positions. I, I hope that sort of helps with the answer to the question. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Defi. That really makes a lot of logical sense. And it and it's also a great relief <laughs> that, you know, uh, we, uh, parents of today are probably making better decisions and, and inculcating better values so that this kind of uh, discrimination doesn't happen um, uh, in the years to come. My second uh, question is to Zoe. You have been raised in a multicultural environment and have been actively involved in culture development projects. What do you think are some cultural issues that women struggle with and how does it affect their choice of profession and impact their personal lives? Zoe. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Zoe from China. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. To answer this question, uh, let me start with a story about myself. Uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, my mom set me up a matchmaking account to find me a future husband. I irritated her because I turned it down many, many times. We had a really bad argument and she called me a loser. I'm 31 years old. Um, and running my own creative company. I think I'm aspirational, hardworking, and I've managed a very positive lifestyle, but being called a loser because I'm single. But meanwhile, my elder male cousin, who is 33 years old, also hardworking, su successful, but single, being called golden bachelor instead. So, 
My university education shaped me as who I am now. I was taught to be kind, independent, um, hardworking, and critical thinking. But all my relatives are trying to lecture me to work harder on marrying good. I have been to a few blind dates, of course, set by my dear parents. Um, but those dates, they tend to see me as a friend because I'm too career driven and uh, too aggressive for them. So that raises the question. Um, modern society provides Chinese women with more opportunities than our mother's generation. While we are working hard and pursuing personal value, we suddenly realize that we have become part of the group that men may not want to marry. And the media even promote unfriendly terms like female PhD, uh, which is Lu Bo Shi in Mandarin, and strong female, which is Lu Qiang Ren in Mandarin, to dis describe ambitious women who either got successful, su successful at work or choose to further their education to doctoral level. Um, but in derogatory sense. So to avoid such social pressure, um, traditional Chinese women are usually rushing into marriage before age of 27 and they tend to work in a more stable and less challenged positions at work. So they could devote more energy to their family and have their husband to grow professionally and financially while giving up their own professional growth. Um, so I can't help wonder, are Chinese women not encouraged to grow professionally and academically? And does it mean that our society deep down believes women depreciate and men appreciate? Is there, a, is there an ultimate gap between women's social value and personal value that couldn't be bridged? Sure. That was, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't answer those questions now, but I'm trying to find a new model for modern Chinese women to grow personally and professionally. Like we have new technologies now to delay the time to give birth. So, peop so women, have the opportunity to free themselves from the family pressure to get married. And also modern female entrepreneurs are connecting and supporting each other to make the, to make the change to the world. Like a uh, cosmic citizen uh, um, um, who's uh, the founder, whose founder is also our meditation tutor today in the morning yes. if anyone has attended it. Yes. Um, Yes, so yeah. we are also trying to make a voice on international conference. Yeah. <laughs> so That's more modern Chinese women like me could stand up and show the world that women have rights and able to choose our own lifestyle, no matter how hard the economy is, but to pursue a personal value above um, yeah. other people's expectations. Absolutely, that's wonderful, and I'm I, I can't and I'm so touched that you shared your own story, and which probably a lot of us in India would definitely resonate that it happened. And um, I'm glad that you know you started, uh, you know, this cosmic world and uh, is an enterprise which is trying to address these issues. Actually, your story and your experience actually brings me to the next speaker, uh, Deborah. Um, Deborah is a serial entrepreneur and uh, she's a corporate legal counsel. Uh, she has seen women struggle with many challenges during her professional journey. Deborah, do you think that the professional world offers a level playing ground for women? If not, what do you think needs to change? Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, good to meet you, everyone. Hi, so uh, women have suffered historical and social disadvantages in the past. So in order to offer a level playing ground for women, we need to start from gender equity. Gender equity is the mean to 
achieve gender equality. We are all talking about gender equality, but actually the first step is we need to start from gender equity. So gender equity is the process of being fair to women to ensure strategies to compensate for women's historical and social disadvantages. To compensate for women's historical and social disadvantages, the policy and mandates of so-called positive discrimination or a push should be implemented to give women a level playing ground with men. And this is uh, gender equity. For example, as we all know, uh, public transportation for women at night is more dangerous. In one city in Sweden, there is a policy that a woman can ask the bus driver to stop the bus at any point during the trip. It doesn't need to be a bus stop. And the driver must also check that no one follows her. The good news here is that this increased the use of public for public transportation by women at night and also increased women's safety. This will also in, will enable women to work later hours to increase the productivity. Women have historical disadvantage with the burden of child care. In order to achieve gender equality, by policy and man mandates that will benefit women to compensate women from these historical dis disadvantages will be like government subsidized childcare, technical support for women to work, be able to work from home, company child daycare and the government mandated maternity leave. The following initiative will make a significant difference to achieve gender equality. Gender equity. Number one, setting goal for hiring and promoting women. For example, we can say this year we want to have 20% of workforce to be women and next year 25%. Number two, we should encourage women to try to apply for, for, inter, for college institution, college institution for program that will yield good high paying job. So, can, we can partner with the institution to offer internship to help women to be able to work, uh, go to engineering school and uh, through the internship then go to have a permanent job with the engineering company. Number three, providing face the time for child care, elder care, maternity leave and uh, housekeeping. Number four, establishing mentoring program to discuss women's specific challenges. Number five, foster inclusive and respectful culture. To foster an inclusive and respectful culture, hum human resources will play an important role to help women who feel they have suffered and, uh, in, um, in, and uh, encountered discrimination and uh, sexual harassment. Number six, company training program to teach women how to um, ask for rates and how to ask, advocate for, for themselves and also how to network with people in the industry. Number seven, to teach women how to negotiate for themselves. This can be done by company training program or for mentor to teach. Increasingly, Corporation and governmental institutions recognize that women's integration into economy at the every level, along with greater wage equality, promotes greater productivity and creativity. The share of women in senior roles globally is increasing incrementally. However, in no country are women equal. In fact, recent data has project it will take 170 years to e reach gender equality globally. Why should we all care about this? $12 trillion could be added to global GDP by 2025. All sectors globally will have to act together to promote policy and mandates for gender equity in work and society. This will make our place a richer and better place for everyone. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Deborah. I think those were very, very relevant points, uh, especially in terms of... 
there is a beep happening. I don't know why. Um, in terms of you know uh, happening, um, uh, you know the the steps that the government, the organizations should take in order to make it a more equitable ground for both men and women. Uh, who's uh, okay? Um, all right. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know from where there was this coming disturbance coming and I. <laughs> I lost it. Okay. Uh, so now my next question is to Radhika. You are one of the women who has shattered the glass ceiling at every stage of your career. From being one of the few women in one of the most prestigious management school in India to making a career in finance and now in the board of many companies. What does it take to be on the board of directors of an organization? It is entirely uh, a male dominated space. How do you make your voice heard? What are those unique qualities that women bring to the table? Radhika. Thanks, Preeti. Those are very relevant questions. And thank you all. It's great to connect with all of you. So in India, it was a regulatory nudge which invited women to the boards of listed companies. In 2014, as per law, every listed company was required to have at least one woman director. And clearly that was the reason professional qualified women for the first time were invited to join boards. I must say that today India's women participation on boards is at 17%, which is higher than Asia's roughly 13% but much lower than USA's in the mid-20s number. And we all know Norway is at 40%. So clearly there is a long way to go. I must also point out that at least in India, only 8% of the women directors are chairing board committees. So again, there is a gap which has to be overcome. I would add that it was regulations which opened the doors for women like me to join corporate boards. But once you have that opportunity, it becomes our responsibility to make that seat at the table count. And I, you asked Preeti that whether the voice would be heard and how is it heard? I believe, and that is not just true for boards, but anywhere, that if your voice is backed by solid research analysis based on sound logic and based on being fair, then people would not only listen to your voice but respect it. So an instance comes to my mind as I say this. Sometime back in one of the boards, a proposal was brought to us to decide and approve a proposal which was very advantageous from tax perspective for the large shareholders. And the only person who brought the perspective of balancing that decision, taking into account the interest of the small shareholders, was the woman in the board. That was me. And very spontaneously, once it was brought to the attention of other board members, it was very much agreed and accepted. Uh, it is no doubt, as you said, a male dominated world. But I got used to it very early in my life. When I went to the business school that you mentioned, we were just five girls in a batch of 180. When I stepped into my career with banking at Bank of America, most meetings I went to, I would be the only woman in the meeting. So being the only woman in the board is not something I'm at all uncomfortable with. In fact, I do not look at myself as a woman director. I'm a director, period. And my contribution is not based on some woman's perspective about issues. Though I'm sure that's something which I and other women also bring to bear on deliberations. 
but my contribution to the board discussions is based on my experience my expertise and which lies with strategy value creation governance capital allocation decisions and so on uh having said that i do feel that men need to be sensitized to become more inclusive and more supportive of women so that they can attain their true full potential uh, i would have loved to have a couple of men on this panel and <laughs> have their perspective and sensitize them to what is being said by many of the fellow panelists and in terms of the unique qualities that you asked for preeti i would say sincerity loyalty and empathy these are qualities i've seen in women throughout my professional life and they work very hard and i think for two reason one because there is much greater scrutiny that they are subjected to in the professional life and also they are so aware of the gender bias that you need to work harder absolutely and uh, as someone just mentioned unless women participate in the economic activities yeah uh the country and the community cannot progress absolutely and i would call it a need from policy makers yeah. to have facilitating provision mm -hmm. to what i call feminization yeah. of economic growth and prosperity awesome so thank you and thank you for your attention yeah thanks a lot radhika those were very very important points um uh, it is indeed important to be as seated at the table but more than that it is important to make those points that are heard and you uh, try to make the difference you know not only uh, uh, to the people around you but by you set uh, an example for others to follow so uh, that was very very insightful and thanks a lot uh, boni uh, unpaid domestic and care work has uh, intensified for both men and women during the covid-19 pandemic as women globally spent about three times as many hours on unpaid domestic and care work as men and the pandemic is expected to further aggravate this gender disparities as many women in the sub sectors are hardest hit by covid-19 and lockdown measures as per the research female jobs are 19% more at risk than male ones simply because women are disproportionately represented in sectors negatively affected by covid so how do you think covid has affected you know uh, in your experience how has it affected women and what is your advice to the women aspiring for leadership positions mm -hmm. you are an executive director at the social enterprise research academy management office so in your opinion what role do women play in the csr space Thank you so much, Prati, and uh, it's my honor to uh, express my view about the COVID nineteen impact on women. And I actually think that you can look at this issue from both sides, like of the coins. Actually, if you look at the bright side, it actually is a a chance for us as business leaders to rethink about how we should do business and to deliver productivity in, within the team. So during COVID nineteen, we all know that we're all doing. Uh, social distancing we're all staying at home so for developed countries i think like or developed cities actually is actually a good things because we can actually try to reimagine the way we work and it will increase more flexibility and actually giving us women more time with our family because we're actually working at home so it's more easier for it striving a balance within the work life um, issues however it's actually also a a extra pain to being locked down at home together all the time and it will also create a lot of conflicts within um relationships and actually within families as well so we can also imagine because as a women we have to take care of our children so we have to also take care of work and it will actually create a lot of uh problem as well so and a lot of pressure within the family so it's actually one of the a game changing um I can I would say COVID nineteen is actually a game changing, uh, as stimuli to the 
all kinds of relationships to work relationships to family as well so um actually and for, uh, we have also have to look at the developing countries such as um, uh, within the slums areas. We also see a lot of news about um, there's a lot of um, uh, jobless uh, occurred because uh, there's no travel. And we know that a lot of uh, uh, countries such as Thailand, uh, Indonesia or India actually depend a lot of tr um, on tourism. And without the jobs, you know, people actually, they, they, they actually earn their living by day to day uh, work. So so it would be an issue as well. And that people are actually very, um, very concentrated within the slum area because of the lockdown. So there will be a lot of domestic violence uh, within these areas. And I think that, that is why CSR should play a, a much uh, important role in the in this COVID-19 areas. Actually, we can see a lot of charities such as Red Cross has been addressing these issues uh, of um, female um, the, the, uh, on female workers uh, um, without the job and also on poverty issues actually getting even worse. So we think the CSR should actually um, play a much um, important role uh, for companies who want to uh, engage uh, in the society uh, in COVID-19. And uh, for uh, responding to uh, what, uh, what I think women should be um, uh, addressing the gender gap issue uh, within the workspace. Uh, one of the issues I realized uh, uh, not only in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, but also in most of the places is uh, women actually are not um, too willing to take up the leadership role as responding to what Zoe, as Zoe just mentioned. Um, it's not easy to, for women to, to, to take up a leadership role or even to, to be, a, be strong in business in uh, Asian societies. So, um, what is what the reason is uh, one of the reasons is culture and another reason is uh, I think that is because uh, of uh, we're not confident enough uh, to to take up leadership role. So uh, my advice would be uh, just like what um, the the author of Lin and uh, Sandra as uh, called Cheryl Sandsberg. She actually uh, also mentioned about how. Um, the gender gap is actually about the women confidence in leadership issues. So I think that uh, I would encourage women to to rethink. And uh, actually, we are very competent. We are able to uh, take care of families. We're able to take care of a lot of things. Uh, we're actually we we talk about emotional intelligence. We're actually uh, usually, in general speaking, is much more uh, stronger than uh, men, uh, which are more task oriented sometimes. So. I think that uh, we should appreciate ourselves more and to um, be more uh, confident in the leading position so as to break the glass ceilings and increase the women representation in leadership position. So thank you very much for allowing us to share, Prati, and yeah, and I hope the CSR could actually uh, play a stronger uh, role in uh, female empowerment as well. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Bonnie. Those were wonderful prior, uh, points. And women really have to work. Uh, more reengineering has to happen within inside uh, to build the confidence that confidence that is required uh, to aspire for the leadership positions. Now that takes me uh, to the the next uh, um, uh, you know panelist, uh, Ivy. You are an amazingly successful woman. Uh, you are co-founder of the Billionaire Girls Club and chairman and CEO of Empowering Billion Women. So what do you think it takes to build the she economy? What are the steps that women should uh, take to overcome the economic struggles, come out more confident and minimize financial disparity? Well, Preeti, thank you so much for having me here. And I know we only have a few minutes left. I so appreciate all of you that are here with us uh, today. Uh, joining us in this session. And it's really neat that I'm coming right after Bonnie because as I'm listening to her comments talking about uh, the confidence of women that prior to COVID, uh, you know, I many years ago, uh, set, well, in 2015, I set up a $100 million fund to help uh, fund women-led ventures because women will always say the number one thing that's holding us back is actually lack of access to capital. So I, I teamed up with Dell Computers again, set up this $100 million fund. And for the next three months, not a single woman applied to that fund. The men did. 
And I didn't understand what was going on. Our whole team went into researching what was happening here. And it came down to exactly what Bonnie is saying, this uh, lack of confidence. And it's something that as women, we don't talk about a lot. And that lack of confidence really, it, it all uh, really stems from the fact that historically men, you know, we always say we're never going to elevate to our, fu our fullest potential if we're not doing it in collaboration with the men, but men have been the one that have been leading the charge. And so as women, we haven't had those same role models. And so they're understandably, it's of course this lack of, of confidence that's there. But what COVID has done for us and what this past year has done for us is really break that mold open. And the reason for that is because COVID and the pandemic has hit all of us around the world. Our economies have been hit, women have been hit, men have been hit, families have been hit. And for the first time ever in our global history, in our global economy, women are realizing that, wait a minute, if we're going to activate this economy, let's just look at the facts for a moment. If we look at the facts, okay, women are controlling 70% of the global economic spend. In the United States, we control 80% of that spend. So women are beginning to say, wait a minute, we have a voice here. We have an opportunity to sit at the table. Number two, from a health perspective, again, as Bonnie, you said, women are being, a number of women have been, has said here, but women are being hit disproportionately uh, considered to the men during the pandemic. The reason for that is because the majority of the healthcare workers are women. The majority of the people who are taking care of the children when they come back home and they can't go to school are the women. So women are being affected very differently than the men. Uh, than the men. And what that's doing is having women sort of being backed against a wall and saying, wait a minute, all these things that we've held ourselves back against before, we're controlling the global wa the wallet spend we're being hit disproportionately compared to the men. And if we look at the facts, number three, from an economic standpoint, women, when we are supported and we are driving business, we tend to generate 12% higher revenue than our male counterparts, 35% higher return on investment, and we reinvest 90% of what we earn back into our families, communities, and ultimately the world. And so bottom line is the fastest economic engine to getting our global economy back on track and back to where, not only where we have been, but where we can be is activating the she economy. And I think what we're re really beginning to see is this unprecedented uh, sort of coming of being, this this birthing of women, owning our fullest potential in the global economy to owning the opportunity of driving our economy forward. And I think the lesson here is really just um, a message of collaboration with the men, that we have recognize that our time has arrived. And because of the pandemic, we're not going to wait for anybody else to solve our issues. And we are prepared uh, and not letting anything else holding us back. We're ready, ready to stand up, take our seat at the table and help leverage the fact that we're driving the global economy and starting to make decisions on how we can drive our economy better going forward. Thank you.